I'm going to be talking about speech today, but a particular kind of speech that, um, at least in my life, I all too frequently ignore it, the opportunity it presents itself. But um, it reminded me of a story, perhaps you've heard it, but three uh, young boys are kind of bragging about their dads, and I should have saved this for Father's Day, but um, one, uh, the first little guy said, uh, you know, my, my dad just scribbles out a few words, and he calls it a poem, and he makes 50 bucks. And uh, the second little guy says, well, that's nothing. My dad uh, scri- scribbles out a, a 100 words and calls it a song, and he makes 500 bucks. And the third little guy says, well, my dad scribbles out a few words and calls it a sermon, and it takes six grown men to collect all the money. <laughs> So uh, that tops, that trumps everything else, I guess. Uh, Speech. Speech is an incredible gift. You know, uh, humans and angels, but uh, humans, we're the only ones, we we practice speech. And uh, there are some animals that can kind of communicate, but they cannot uh, practice speech. And they certainly can't talk to their creator. Uh, they can make noises, and they can wag their tails, and they can uh, chirp and sing and all that stuff. But as far as communicating um, thoughts, uh, speech is a pretty incredible thing. And, um, you know, if you, if you have difficulties with speech for some reason, a medical reason or whatever, disability, you can still uh, sign language or we could write out things. And, um, but one of the most neglected speech uh, patterns or opportunities, I think, is uh, we have this incredible opportunity to talk to our creator, to talk to our God, uh, this perfect savior we just sang about. And yet, I think that's one of the most neglected kinds of speech we have. And uh, so what I'm going to be sharing here this morning is not to lay a guilt trip on anybody. Um, I bet we all kind of intuitively know we should pray more. But uh, just praying more, Jesus kind of warned us against that. You know, there's some people who just pray, to, and they just talk, to hear themselves talk. And they repeat themselves over and over and over, and it really goes nowhere. Uh, so I'm not going to exhort you to talk uh, to God more, just multiply your words. I'm going to try and uh, give you four principles here in Colossians chapter 4, just a couple verses, actually, verse 2 and 3, but to talk about, um, to pray precisely with intelligence, uh, with, with focus, with purpose, and, um, and see how incredibly um, exciting it is to talk to our Savior and to see him act on our behalf. So, um, Colossians chapter 4, and just read uh, verse 2 and 3. And we'll jump into it. Um, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God may open to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. Uh, God gives us incredible opportunities to, uh, to speak forth, to preach, to proclaim, to, uh, to share truth, to witness on his behalf. And uh, Paul is saying here, uh, here's a couple things I want you to do for yourselves and for your congregation. But oh yeah, while you're doing that, don't forget to pray for me as well. Uh, the first part of verse three, praying at the same time for us as well that God may open to us a door for the word. Um, He's not going to talk about self-centered and selfish things here, uh, and, and, and praying for yourself is not a bad thing, I don't think, but it's not the main thing. And so, um, first of all, uh, we're going to wake up our PowerPoint back there, I think, it's frozen, and go to the next slide, if you would, please. There we go. Whoops, went too far. Um, your first fill-in is that, at least in my New American Standard, is prayer must be devoted. And um, Paul begins all of his um, prison epistles. There's four of them. And he, uh, right at the outset, he starts with prayer all the time. In fact, it's kind of a good habit when you're studying through the prison epistles 
don't really even look for the doctrinal portion or what, what we can learn from this until you get past his prayers. And um, this devotion to prayers, he had a habit of doing that. And it's actually, uh, it's indicative of the first century church. In fact, all the way back to Acts chapter 1, um, all the uh, disciples were in the upper room, they were all of one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So right from the get-go, in fact, they haven't even uh, experienced Pentecost here yet, but they're already practicing prayer. They're of one mind, they're gathered together, all the believers, and what do they do? They devote themselves to prayer. In fact, um, it's not too far of a stretch. It, that's the first and foremost thing we should do as believers. Uh, yeah, we want to preach the gospel, we want to witness, we want to testify, but we need to be devoted, dedicate our speech, this incredible gift of communication. We should dedicate it to our Lord, talking to him, praising him, singing to him, and uh, uh, giving thanks to him. So we need to be devoted to prayer. And this also has a, another little aspect to this. You know, what happens if, uh, oh yeah, you're pouring out your heart and you're talking to God and you're making requests and uh, he doesn't answer right away, at least not in the fashion that you were asking. Devoted to prayer means you persevere. You, you don't quit. You keep asking. Not to not to beat God down and finally he gives in, but to persevere. The subtitle there, God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. Um, he hears us. He promises to hear us when we pray in humility with, uh, with the goal of uh, seeking his will and we're focused on him. He always hears us. But he doesn't always answer either in the way that we ask or in the time frame. That's up to him. Uh, so if you don't have an answer right away, that doesn't mean, well, just give up, throw in the towel, and move on. No, devote yourself to prayer. Um, here's the second thing. Um, prayer must be dauntless. And I, I just, I'm going for the Ds here. Your fill-ins are going to all be Ds. And dauntless uh, without fear. Uh, with confidence, with faith. So uh, devote yourselves to prayer and then keeping alert in it. You know, we have an enemy. And at least in my personal experience, one of the places where I sense opposition from the enemy the most is when I'm determined to devote myself to prayer. When I, uh, you know, there's a prayer meeting at church or I'm going to get together with some guys and pray, and uh, all of a sudden I've got a thousand things running through my mind that uh, demand my attention. And God wants me to be devoted. Paul is exhorting us to be devoted. Uh, don't quit. Persevere. Uh, be of one mind. Get together with other people. But then be fearless, because we have an enemy. And so here, keep alert. Um, Jesus said to watch. Um, it's all the way through the Old Testament. It's all the way through the New Testament. Be on guard. Be alert. All the way back to Nehemiah. <clears throat> we prayed to our God because of them. And he's talking about the opposition, the enemies. Satan wanted to discourage these guys. Nehemiah wants to lead people back and honor his God by rebuilding the walls and by rededicating Jerusalem to the Lord. But you know what? There's always opposition. And I would bet a dollar to a donut hole in your personal life, your spiritual life, one of the places where you get, uh, where you sense opposition more than any others is when you're devoted to prayer. God, um, God certainly moves without our prayers. But a lot of times, he waits for his people to call upon him. In fact, um, I went to that prophecy thing yesterday down in Reading. Um, Mike went with me, and we had a, a wonderful time of 
uh, being reminded of the prophecies regarding Israel and what's going on over there right now. You'll hear more about that in a little bit. But um, even with this covenant relationship with a chosen people, Jesus has said, I'm not going to come and rescue you until you call on me. And I, I hope it's not too big of a stretch. I think he does that in my life. Bill, I want to bless you. I, I, I want to just do so much through you. I am not going to do it until you ask. you ask. You have not because you ask not, Jesus said. And so here's an example. Nehemiah got on his donkey and <laughs> went around and did a survey. Uh, he did uh, due diligence. He didn't just stay in his little corner and pray and let God do all the work. He prayed. He went out and did a survey. He, he communicated his plan to some faithful guys. And yet he was also, once they started building, they had a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, recognizing there's opposition, there's an enemy here, and they want to discourage us. And so by faith, we're going to move ahead. We're going to build this wall. And oh, by the way, we're going to be alert. It says here, uh, like be alert for this plane coming through right now. Uh, Devote yourselves to prayer and then keep alert in it. Um, be fearless. You're going to have people oppose you. Nehemiah had people come up and get in his face, and they mocked his word. They threatened, uh, we're going to tell the king what you're up to. You're up to rebellion. They tried to do anything they could to, to get him to stop the work. And what did Nehemiah do? He persevered in prayer. He wasn't going to be afraid. He wasn't going to be intimidated. He wasn't going to be uh, put off the job. I'm going to pray that God would protect us, that God would do work through us. And oh, by the way, I've got guys watching for the enemy. We've got our swords on our side. We know we are in a spiritual battle. And I'm thinking Paul is saying here, one of the things I want you guys, you Colossians, I want you to pray, but I want you to be alert in that prayer. Now, um, if you want to, flip back with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And um, <clears throat> this is his first prison epistle. And in chapter 1, verse 15, notice what he says, 15 to 19. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, he's going to say that to the Philippians, he's going to say that to the Colossians, he's... He means it. Um, Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So in Colossians 4, he's saying, make sure you remember to pray for me. Here in these prayers, he's going to say, I'm praying for you. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Notice how uh, focused and deliberate and purposeful his prayers. It's not like... You know, before he, uh, his, his head hits the pillow, oh, dear God, would you please bless the Ephesians? No, he has some specifics here. He wants their eyes to be opened. He wants their hearts to be enlightened. He wants them to know certain things, the surpassing greatness of our God. So one of the things that uh, when I'm being fearless in my prayers, I want to be focused like Paul was for the specific needs of the people I'm praying for. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So um, 
I think I can take from this one thing is that I'm not going to be praying just for people like me or people in my church or people in my family. I'm going to be praying for humans all over. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Yeah, we're concerned for the outer man, for uh, physical well-being, for health, and those are all legitimate needs. We've, we've been decimated again with a lot of illness the last uh, month or so, and certainly we pray for healing. We pray for recovery. We pray for strength. But one of the things that Paul emphasizes always in his prayers is that he wants the inner man to get stronger. Even as our outer man is kind of, uh, you know, weakening and waning, and I'm getting to notice that in my life a lot more than I did a while back, uh, <clears throat> can't do a few things that I used to be able to do, but I hope my inner man is actually getting stronger. My faith is growing. My confidence in God, my devotion to pray for other people. And then in verse um, 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. So he's also praying for some people that aren't even believers yet, looks like to me. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. If, if they were already believers, Christ would be there dwelling in their hearts. That's not something that happens subsequent to salvation, it happens at salvation. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And there is a benediction that I sometimes read at the end of our church services. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Wow, what an what a incredible promise. Uh, he wants us to pray, and even when we pray intelligently, purposefully, focused, God could still do much more than what we're asking. Uh, we don't, he doesn't get tired. If, if too many of us are calling on him, uh, he doesn't say, well, Bill, you're going to have to wait, man, I'm just... I'm bushed. No, God is not, he, invite, he wants to respond to our prayers. We don't have to wear him down, and, he, and we don't wear him down by our, our devotion to prayers. He wants to hear from his children. He gave us the gift of speech. He gave us the avenue to approach him through Christ, right into the throne room of God. He wants us, and then, but he can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. That uh, prayer up there in verse 17, that Christ would dwell in your hearts. In verse 20, yeah, that power, that power that created the world, the universe, that sustains life, that power that raised Christ from the dead, that power is in us. To him be the glory, verse 21, in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Then uh, just flip over to the right a little bit. Another um, prayer that starts out the second epistle, the uh, prison epistle, the Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Again, it's not just, oh, Lord, bless the missionaries. Good night. Specifics. I'm praying for you that your love will abound and that you'll have discernment. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a time of danger and deception. We had better be discerning or we will be swept away just like so many other churches and so many other people. Uh, verse 10, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. So part of my prayer for myself and for you should be, uh, God, 
Give us discernment so that we can live lives that are, that are pleasing to you and blameless, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Then just uh, one more here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. Remember, he starts all of his epistles with a prayer. And um, the prison epistles are just like that. Chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason also, we've heard that phrase already, since the day we heard of it. What's he talking about? Well, in verses 3, 4, and 5, he's talking about their faith and their hope and their love. So in verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard of that, your testimony, Colossians, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that, there's a, there's a purpose here, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in, in uh, light. So um, the Colossians had the Apostle Paul devoted to praying for them. He did that for the Ephesians. He did that for the Philippians. He did that for his countrymen, the Jews, who had rejected Jesus Christ. In fact, his, his devotion was so much to God for them that he said, if it was possible, I would go to hell to save my countrymen. If it was possible, I would lose my salvation if it meant saving those people. Now, um, true confessions, I don't pray like that. Sorry. Uh, I don't want to trade my salvation for yours. But man, what a picture of devotion and, and humility and commitment and love. And he's praying for these people. And so um, Nehemiah is an example. Jesus Christ, the same thing, this, this praying without fear. Of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So watch, therefore. Uh, uh, stay alert, Paul says here in 4.2. Uh, Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. And Jesus said the same thing, the same word, watch. Some of your translations will actually say that in, in uh, Colossians 4.2. Watch. Stay alert. Uh, don't... It's not just don't get drowsy. I mean, there's times where you, you, if you're like me, you've probably fallen asleep praying. Um, I know some of you fall asleep when I'm preaching. <clears throat> I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll pray for you. But <clears throat> uh, this idea is not just don't get drowsy. Be alert to the fact you have an enemy who wants to discourage you, and one of the areas where he really wants to hammer you is to get you away from devotion to prayer. He knows that a, a, a praying Christian on their knees is the biggest threat to his kingdom of all. A Christian who is praying is more powerful than Satan. One more that Jesus used in, in the next chapter, Mark 14, Simon. Now, this is, uh, this is in the garden. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying. Now, yes, he was tired. He was sleepy. It's a long day. But they were already on their way up the Mount of Olives, um, the Jews and the soldiers and the guards, they were already working their way up towards the garden. And not only did they, the guys get drowsy and fall asleep physically, they were, they were asleep spiritually. 
The enemy is right here. Jesus is sweating great drops of blood, and he asks these three guys, these three faithful disciples, the inner circle, hey, uh, come a little bit closer away from these guys, and would you just watch and pray? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, we got that, Lord. And just in a few minutes, <laughs> three times he went back and said, are you sleeping? Uh, what an example to me. Bill, wake up. Not just uh, have the energy to get through your prayer time, but wake up to the fact that there is opposition to this ministry. There's opposition to this church. There's opposition to God's chosen people, Israel. There's opposition to Vacation Bible School. Do you know we have an enemy that doesn't want our VBS to succeed? And you think, well, you know, I can't be a teacher. I, I've got a job. I, I can't be available that week. You know what you can do? Pray. Pray for a breakthrough in these young people's lives and in the lives of their moms and dads or grandparents who bring them to VBS. They drop them off. And a lot of those parents, they're not praying for those kids. They're not praying for the kids' teachers. They're not praying for the games. They're not praying for the lessons. They're not pray praying for the songs that they're learning and the verses they memorize. Whose job is that? Us. If you, even if you are involved, especially, you know, that's a long week, you get worn out, and by Thursday you're ready to quit and you've pulled all your hair out. But the rest of us should be praying. Praying that our volunteers stay healthy. Praying that they're, they are able to communicate filled by the Holy Spirit, the clear gospel to these kids. Pray that these kids will respond in faith. Be devoted to prayer and be fearless. Yeah, we've got opposition, we've got an enemy, so what? Greater is he that lives inside you than he that is in the world. Man, be praying for our youth ministry. Be praying. Uh, I'll mention here a second in the open doors, but uh, Pastor Tyler has an opportunity uh, every Thursday during the school year, he meets with high school kids on campus. Do you think there's opposition there? Yeah. Pray for him. Pray for Awana that's going to start up again. Pray for uh, activities this summer. Pray for our Sunday school ministries. Pray for Celebrate Recovery. You think there's opposition there? The devil doesn't want people to be broken free from bondage. He's got them right where he wants them. What's going to help? Somebody praying, devoted to prayer, and somebody verbalizing the message of freedom in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6. <clears throat> with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. I'm locked up in prison. Pray for me that I can witness to my guards. And he did. A bunch of people in Caesar's own household got saved through uh, Paul's prison ministry. And there were some guards chained to him. Oh, man, you got Paul duty? Yeah. And some of them got saved. Paul, even though he couldn't preach openly out in the churches, he's locked up in a dungeon somewhere. And what does he do? He leads Onesimus to the Lord. And he writes the little prison epistle by Lehman and sends that letter back to uh, Onesimus' um, owner, Philemon, and talks about grace. So yeah, you might find yourself in a difficult, you've got opposition. You might find yourself in a difficult position. Pray. Pray that God will use you to, with your gift of speech, tell people about Jesus Christ. Well, here's the third thing we've got to move along. Prayer must be uh, devout. And what I'm talking about here, uh, the last part of verse 2, 
uh, first of all, devote yourselves to prayer and they, uh, be dauntless, uh, you know, keep alert. We've got an enemy. Don't be afraid. And then the third thing is um, devout. Uh, pray with a spirit of thanksgiving. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, means committed to gratitude. Again, uh, back in Colossians chapter 1, we give thanks to God of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. You know, one of the biggest things I should be doing when I'm praying, just telling God, thank you. You say, well, I don't know what to pray about. Well, why don't you pray about uh, what you can be thankful for that God has given you? That'll keep you busy. Just, just uh, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And you'll be amazed at what God has done in your life. Just, just say, thank you, God. And uh, if you're praying on behalf of somebody else, thank you, God, for uh, so-and-so serving in VBS or Children's Church or in the nursery. Thank you, God, for the people who lead us in worship. Thank you, God, for the sound techs and the people that clean the church and the security team. Just say thank you, and that'll keep you busy for a while. And let the peace of Christ... Rule in your hearts. Notice how many times he's already talked about being thankful in Colossians. Chapter 1, and now here's chapter 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And just be thankful. I am so thankful I'm a part of this church. I'm thankful you're a part of this church. I'm thankful that God has planted us here to reach weed. Now, there's other believers here in Weed and the Shastina, Edgewood, all around, Dunsmere. That's praise God. But our mission field, South Siskiyou County, I'm so thankful we're here. We've got opposition. Man, we've, we've um, <clears throat> the enemy doesn't want you to have a good reputation in this town. The enemy wants to point out some of our failures or weaknesses, and uh, publish them all over the county. Persevere. Be devoted to prayer. Uh, pray for God's glory, not ours. And so here, uh, verses 15 and 17, just be thankful, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So we pray in the name of Jesus, but our goal is to, to pray to Father, <clears throat> just thank you. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for my family. Thank you for our church. Thank you. Just tell him thanks. That's going to keep you busy for a while. And then the last thing here in verse 3, prayer must be diligent. Praying at the same time for us as well that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak. For, well, wait a minute, Paul, you're in jail. What are you talking about opening up a, a, a way for the word? I want you to pray for us as well. I've been praying for you, Colossians. I've been praying for you, Ephesians. I've been praying for you, Philippians. And now he's saying, pray for me. I'm locked up. I'm a prisoner. What, what's my crime? I love Jesus. I, I, I proclaimed the resurrection of Christ. Oh, and I told the Jews that Gentiles can be saved and they don't have to become Jewish first. That got me locked up. <laughs> so pray for us as well that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. Now, uh, this book is not a verbal use of his speech, but uh, somebody was praying, oh, Lord, please use the Apostle Paul in his imprisonment. What did he do? He wrote four books of our New Testament. He was productive. He led people to the Lord from his chains. And he's saying, <laughs> uh, just pray for us that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. 
And then he goes down in the next few verses to talk about the, our speech among ourselves and our speech uh, among unbelievers. Be careful how you speak. It reflects on your Savior. You know, a lack of focus in my prayers often means a lack of faith. You see, if you pray specifically, you, if you pray for specific things, um, that takes faith. If I just say, oh, Lord, uh, please bless uh, Dan's Sunday school class. I mean, you can do that, and I want you to do that. But that's not really praying specifically. You know, if we pray specifically that things would happen in the lives of people in his class, we pray specifically for um, outreach to the lost in our county. We pray specifically for VBS. Oh, Lord, we're praying for 10 young people to give their heart to Jesus this week. Well, that takes faith. When you pray specifically, if you just pray generally or you're not focused, you hope, oh God, uh, please bless the missionaries. Good night. No, um, our missions committee works hard at keeping us informed of the needs of our missionaries and their families and their ministries. Uh, avail yourselves of those cards, those prayer requests, those, that bit of information. So why? You can pray specifically. Pray for open doors. You know, our church has a, a, a kind of a neat history of open doors around here. I was just kind of jotting some down this morning. <clears throat> and uh, Pastor Jerry, my, my predecessor here, uh, way back in the 70s, he prayed for an opportunity to uh, speak on the radio. KWSD back in those days. And uh, God opened that door. They put his sermon on the radio every week, way back in the 70s. <clears throat> we started a Crosswalk. I mentioned it a moment ago with Pastor Tyler. It's still continuing. We started that <clears throat> in 1997. And uh, had a lot of helpers along the way. We kind of stopped there for COVID for a while, and now it's restarted. Um, recently, had as many as 20 students in that crosswalk class with, uh, they meet at lunchtime. In those days, we used to meet in Dandy Ross's Sunday school, I mean, not Sunday school, but his classroom back in the late 90s. Um, our church prayed for an opportunity to plant another church. Um, in 2005, we planted Hub City Bible Church in Reading. Uh, lasted five years. And um, the pastor and his family, they had some health issues and it shut down. But uh, some of you were part of that. We used to go Sunday nights and go down there to Reading and, and uh, do a Bible study and do a worship service. It turned into a church. Um, release time. We had a release time for years. We used to uh, pick them up in the old Ford for the Lord bus, haul them down to our church, and give them Bible instructions. They got out of school for 45 minutes. We taught them about Jesus and then took them back. Uh, then after a while, we just walked them down the hill to the Merck building and walked them back. We had a lot of volunteers. It was an open door. Public schools... Uh, have an opportunity to take some kids out of the public school setting, give them religious instruction, and then give them back. Oh, man. We had, um, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, Open Door in India, our fellowship, set a goal that we would plant 300 churches in India in three years. We did it. It's not because our fellowship is wealthy and huge, but our God is. Our God is wealthy. Our God is huge. Our God loves the Indian people. There's a billion of them over there who don't know him. 
man, we prayed for open doors, and God says, here's one, walk through. And we've got a whole list of them. We've got a great history, a heritage at this, at this church. And I dare to believe our best days might still be ahead of us. Let's redouble our efforts to reach young people and old people and in-between people with Jesus Christ and his gospel. So prayer must be purposeful, specific, and detailed to evidence faith. Now, it's okay to, you know, just kind of be general once in a while. Oh, God, please bless our church. Or bless Pastor Bill. He's going to try and give us the word today or something. But be specific and purposeful and detailed that reflects more faith. About 4,500 Protestant churches closed in 2019. The last year data is available. <clears throat> um, 4,500 closed, 3,000 new ones opened. It's the first time the number of churches in the U.S. hadn't grown since the evangelical firm uh, Lifeway Research started studying the topic. With the pandemic speeding up a broader trend of Americans turning away from Christianity, Churches are closing today more than opening. Pray that that trend will reverse. Pray that the remaining churches would be faithful in their preaching of the truth. That's why these churches are closing in many cases. Some of them folded up their tent. They were fearful when the governors or somebody said, oh, you churches, we don't want you meeting during COVID. Okay, we're going to close our doors. We closed one Sunday, March 22nd, 2020, and we've been open ever since. I say that not to boast or to rub it in the noses of people who cared about our health, but I'm saying God wants this church open, and God wants other churches open and planted and thriving we need more churches, not fewer churches. The pandemic, a lot of people who are weakly attached, not W-E-E-K, W-E-A-K, weakly attached to suddenly having months of not going, uh, well, we don't really need to go, or we've found something else to do, or it was hard enough dragging the kids along then, we really ought to start going back. You know, we still haven't reached our pre-COVID numbers yet in attendance, you might find that hard to believe. We're not there yet. So let's pray. Let's redouble our efforts. Let's invite people to church. Let's see people come to faith in Jesus Christ and get them plugged in. Texas, one of the exemptions or exceptions, I should say, Texas and Florida, they didn't close their churches and they didn't end up selling a bunch of them. California, churches were for sale all over the place. Closed, let's turn them into something else. So with this emphasis on prayer, um, today we are joining hundreds of churches that are, uh, have selected today to spend time in prayer, and in particular, focused, specific, detailed, praying for Israel. <clears throat> oh Lord, we thank you, God, for uh, the reports that uh, the church in Iran is just growing abundantly and rapidly and deeply, and we pray that uh, that would continue, God, that you, you said you were going to build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it, so we, we recognize you have a plan, and God, we pray that you'd be glorified. We pray that uh, the, the church in Iran would be uh, visible and vocal and uh, victorious and uh, discerning and influential in, um, in, uh, with a, a regime there that wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. We pray, God, if there's any preemptive strikes up there or bombings or something, that the Christians would be spared. Um, God, we pray for 
um, as we've already prayed for our nation response, that we would not turn our historic uh, uh, support for Israel, that we would not turn it away from them at this critical time. We are we're struck but how how quickly anti-Semitism has uh, grown and uh, become so uh, entrenched on our college campuses and around the world. We, we support the right to protest. We, we support the right to petition and all that. We don't support the destruction of property or the threatening of Jewish students or the uh, curtailment of free speech with alternative views. We pray that law enforcement would have the support of college administrators and uh, state government officials that they could go in and root out these uh, sometimes violent protests and destructive um, arsons and all of these guys that would, would restore uh, order. We pray that it would not uh, silence the church in uh, celebrating that you have two uh, groups of chosen people, historically the, the Israel, the, and they still have some future with you, God. And, uh, and we also recognize that the church is, ch we're elect also, we are chosen. And there are Jews and Gentiles that make up the body of Christ. May uh, the Jewish portion of that be effective in witnessing God, and, and the Gentiles too to uh, Jews who are uh, physical descendants of Abraham, but they don't have his faith. We pray for the church in Israel um, to rise up, God, to multiply, to reproduce. We pray that the church worldwide would support uh, those evangelistic and mission efforts inside Israel. Uh, thank you for those that are willing to go over there in the midst of this danger and this hatred Please protect them, God, and we pray um, that the Israel would discern the times that they're living in, that they would call upon Jesus Christ, their Messiah, and uh, trust him for their salvation. And uh, God, we thank you for the churches across our nation that have united in this time of uh, solidarity. Again, um, it's not like any of these nations, Israel included, it's not like they don't make horrible mistakes, but Israel is fighting for their life, God, and they're, they're not yet corporately trusting you. So we, we pray for them. We know you're going to spare them. Prophetically, you have promised that. But we pray, as we started out with Pastor Tyler, praying for these families that are so devastated and traumatized. God, may they know the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. May they know the protection of God. May they sense your presence and that they would respond in faith if they're not already believers. Thank you for moving that blood bank just in time. We thank you for the first responders and the military and the um, the paramedics, the medical people that run to the explosions and, and provide aid. God, may you protect them. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, this service. We want to thank you, God, for your help in all these matters. Thank you for the avenue of prayer. And uh, God, we pray that you'd bless us as we close with this song, Lord, that it would um, just encourage your people. In Jesus' name, amen.